Hello and welcome back to AMBV. I'm Casper and today we're going to be hiding out from coronavirus by working on the 1940 Chevy. Behind me you can see the 1940 Chevy I purchased last year. Now, the short story for those who haven't been following the channel, this car was an impulse purchase. I negotiated the price down for somebody else, they didn't buy the car and I couldn't pass it up. I haven't really done a lot to the car except for take it out on the weekends and just kind of keep the oil moving and fix a broken suspension mount. But other than that, the car's basically the way I bought it and it has a lot of glaring problems that I really want to rectify. The one I'm going to be dealing with today, thanks to COVID-19 basically shutting the world down and killing my ability to get UPS shipments for my other cars, is the electric fan setup on this vehicle. Now, I don't have a problem with cars with electric fans, obviously. I actually quite like them over mechanical fans in a lot of applications, but they have to have been done correctly. This car is a perfect example of a home-built project done entirely wrong. And based on my quick cursory look at the wiring, I think somebody actually tried to do it closer to right at some point in the past, and then someone else came along and didn't understand wiring and just tried to hobpodge something together till it worked. Now, the biggest culprits in this disaster are the fact that two electric fans are sharing one circuit where all of the draw is sent down an 18 gauge wire straight from the positive post of the battery through a toggle switch to the fans, and then it's grounded out on the body of the car. Now, there's a lot wrong with that, but the biggest problem there is probably the wiring. 18 gauge wire is not sufficient for two electric fans for an almost 20 foot run or more. Now, the longer the distance goes between the point where you're drawing power from and where you're using it, you need to change the gauge of wire you're working with. And in general, most of my little cheat sheet charts and things would tell me that a system pulling juice from this distance should be using probably a 10 to 14 gauge wire, depending on your wire and some other specifics of the system. Now, that is significantly bigger than 18 gauge wire, which is currently in the car. Now, if that weren't bad enough, there's no safety mechanism on the circuit. There's no fuse, there's no breaker, there's nothing to keep the car from burning to the ground if this were to ground out and fail. On top of that, the entire draw for the circuit is going through a toggle switch. That again is not something anyone should be doing in the modern age. You should be using a toggle switch if you're going to use a toggle switch to engage or disengage a relay. The relay should carry the majority of the actual load from the battery to your device, whatever it is, in this case, a fan. Now, knowing this and looking under the dash, it looks like somebody at one point in time did try to correct this problem and actually has a relay up there, but someone else came along and cut it all loose because they couldn't figure it out and put this wiring in. Now, I just need to figure out exactly what's going on and try to correct all of it in one shot. I would like to simplify the loom so that it's much easier to plug, unplug, and to troubleshoot. So let's start looking around at what we've got under the hood and see what we can keep and what we've got to get rid of. Looking under the hood here, we can see the worst of the wiring is definitely the electric fans. There's a lot of the other wiring that I would like to replace and that I don't necessarily agree with how they did it, but it's actually not bad enough that it needs to be replaced. The electric fans have to be replaced because this is a flat out fire hazard not to mention the electric fan system is the only thing that will cool your engine in the case of exceeding the capacities of your radiator. Now, because of a car like this being mostly a parade car, you're not spending a lot of time at freeway speeds compared to crawling along with a bunch of other cars' hot exhausts. So when we look at this system, I will get start building it so that you don't have to sit here and watch me talk for the next 10 minutes, but you'll see me build out the rest of the system. Now, the current system here has three major failures as I kind of addressed earlier. There is a failure to protect the circuit from a short. It doesn't have a fuse or a circuit breaker. There is too much amperage being drawn through this little tiny 18 gauge wire. The longer a run of wire goes, the thicker it should be in general. There are a lot of cheat sheet charts out here like this one to tell you roughly at what distances you need to go to what gauge wire. And in my case, I'm going to be running 10 gauge wire through here. 
It did not use a relay, it used a switch. A switch should not be used to pass all the current through. That is not something that is recommended in any way, shape, or form because that is one more place that can catch fire, burn up, causes resistance, all kinds of problems. Now, this system also has a major failure that it's not grounded properly. Now, an important system like your radiator system for cooling or something to do with your EFI or your ignition system should have good quality grounds. If they are grounded in perfectly, you can have resistance from the grounds from corrosion or rust, but you can also deal with the problem of having them wiggle loose or having them sometimes disrupted. And the last thing you wanna be doing is driving along in a 100 plus degree day with your electric fans humming along full blast and have that resistance cause the circuit to burn up or to have the screw wiggle loose so your radiator fan stop working and you wouldn't know until you see your gauge pegged out and coolant spewing all over the ground, hopefully not destroying your engine. Now, because we're adding a relay in the mix here, this will give me the ability to also toggle it on from multiple sources. I will probably look at reusing the switch here because it looks cool, it fits in, and I like having a manual override. But this relay, because of the structure of a relay, it only needs a positive and a negative to trigger the system. Now, I can either send it the positive from the switch or the negative from the switch. Now, ideally, what I want to do is wire it up so that it's negative from the switch. It's grounded when the switch is activated. What that allows me to do is to pull the positive from the ignition system, which will then tell me, for instance, an ignition on source means that if I turn the key off, the relay will open and the fans will turn off. That'll keep the fans from running while the car is off. Now, additionally, what that allows me to do, because the switched side is negative, if I add sniper EFI to this system, I can send its grounded fan signal to the same wire, tee it in, and have it have the same ability as the switch to turn on the relay to then run the fans. Now, to solve the poor wiring situation of the ground for this whole circuit, I'm going to be adding another wire back to the battery post for that specific portion of the circuit. So I will have a 10 gauge wire running from the battery to the car in either inside the cabin compartment, either having a fuse or having a circuit breaker. It will then go to the relay. From the relay, it will continue as 10 gauge until it gets to the front of the car where the fans are, at which point it will be split out to the smaller gauge of the fans and that end will be heat shrinked and glued and everything nicely. I will then have the negatives of the fans spliced into a 10 gauge black that will carry the ground all the way back to the battery. Now, if you see any of my tools out here, I was hoping to get really fancy with this. And what I would like to do also is add in an LED indicator under the dash as I'm making the wiring harness because this will tell me when the fan circuit is actually engaged. Otherwise, I can toggle the switch while I'm cruising along in a parade, but the odds of me hearing the fans actually running over the V8 are pretty slim. This gives me a second check to make sure power is being sent there. Also, if I have the toggle on, or if I have the computer telling the fans to come on, and they're not on, that LED gives me one more indicator to see if is there actual voltage passing through that circuit, or is the relay bad, or is there disconnected from the battery, or what's happened? If the LED's on and the fans aren't working, that tells me that the circuit is actually good, the fans have died, and that I need to replace the fans. Now, once this is all back in the car, one of the most important things is to make sure you route it and wrap it all properly. Now, most of the wrap around these wires is more to protect them from other things than to protect stuff from them. You're trying to keep things from rubbing into the wires, things from heating the wires up, anything that might cause the insulation of the wire to degrade to the point that it could short out or break. In my case here, I only actually need to carry two wires all the way back to the front of the car. So those wires just need to be bundled together sheathed, 
and then labeled and run to the front of the car effectively before being split out. I do want to use connectors where possible because this does need to have replaceability. I don't want to have to cut it every single time I want to replace something because eventually you'll run out of wire. It'll just keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. But also if you have some nice plugs, it makes it a lot quicker in a parking lot to do a repair. You can just plug it out, plug it in and call it good. Now, for the most part, inside the cabin, I'm not going to be able to do a lot of separate plugs. I'll do some, but for the most part, I want it as reliable as possible. And because of the way it's run, I can just pull it off the battery and pull it back through the firewall. Where it does go through the firewalls, you would ideally want to use a nice grommet as well as some protection around the wire. Some people will just send through a piece of sheath wire and call it good, but that sheathing isn't nearly as hard as the metal is. And if you don't put a grommet on there, the part that actually moves is the wire, not the metal. So if you put a grommet, the grommet will rest against the metal. It won't move, so it won't wear through the grommet. But then you can also put the sheathing on the wire just to give it a little more protection. And it also just looks cleaner when it goes through the firewall. Once you have it all bundled and run out to the right lengths, you can start either zip tying it together and using corrugated tubing or split loom protector on it. In my case, I'm going to be using a combination of different methods to combine this just because I didn't buy components specifically for this project. And also, I don't think this is the final iteration of this system. I would really like to replace the connections that come through the firewall and get rid of the grommets and put in some motorsport connectors to where the harnesses on the weather side of the bulkhead are actually separate from the harnesses on the inside of the bulkhead. Now, I could talk about the wiring systems and different philosophies about the way to go about doing this all day, but ultimately, at the end of the day, as long as you follow the basic recipe of making sure your power is being delivered through a secured circuit where the load is being carried by something that is intended to carry the load, you should be fine. Now, one thing you can do is really quickly Google what it is that you're supplying power for and get an idea of how much demand it has or look at the stickers on the device depending if it's properly labeled and that will tell you how many amps to prepare for on the circuit. In my case, I know electric fans usually pull around 30 amps or so. Like, I, I would be surprised if it was much higher than that, but they can get as high as 50. Now. In this situation, based on cheat sheet charts online, I can tell that my 10 gauge solution of wire will be plenty for this. But if this were something else, for instance, the charging cable from an alternator, or if I were relocating the battery to a back of a trunk, I would need to adjust my wire gauge appropriately. Now, another thing that will change what wire gauge you use is the composition of the wire itself. Are you working with pure copper? Are you working with copper coated aluminum? What is the actual connector types you're using? Those will all change what you're allowed to get away with because wherever you're putting crimps and connections and solder and things like this on are going to change resistances as you go through your circuit. And if this is a very, very high power circuit, you'll run into a lot of problems really quickly with heat buildup in particular points in the wiring harness. Now that I've got the basics of the wiring harness laid out here and put together, let's see if I can actually fire up the fans.
As you can tell from the wardrobe change, I didn't finish everything yesterday. Now, building wiring harnesses is really time consuming anyway, but I wanted to sleep on a few things. The two biggest being, I wasn't sold on the idea of an indicator light. The LED under the dash that would have indicated whether or not this circuit had power was something I kind of liked the idea of, but couldn't figure out where I was gonna work it into a 1940s interior. So I ended up leaving that out. I also decided finally to go ahead and use Deutsch connectors on the radiator fans. I wanted something that I could unplug and replace the fans with without having to mess with the harness. And these seem to be the best option of what I had on the shop. They're just a little spendy. Now, ultimately that does make it a lot easier in the future if I do replace a radiator fan because all I have to do is depin the connection, repin the connection and plug it right back in. Now, everywhere I had to join wires, whether it was fanning out from the 10 gauge to the 16 gauge for the fans or anywhere I was splicing into other existing wire, I used OE style solder connectors. That is probably the best way to go about doing it with today's technology, but I find that they sometimes are a little weak when it comes to bending. So I went through and covered most of them anywhere that might get bent or have to be pulled on with additional adhesive lined heavy duty shrink tubing to give it that extra rigidity to keep that from being the point that bent. Ultimately, this is probably a very nice harness for compared to whatever's in this car, and especially compared to what I ripped out of this car, but there's a lot more I wanna do in the car, and I decided to go ahead and set up this as my standard, and the rest of the harnesses I replace in the future will look similar. All I used for covering was the expandable braided covering that has like a 300 degree melt point, and I just used my oversized adhesive lined shrink tubing to clamp the ends in place. Being as how it shrinks into place, it mechanically locks it, but also the adhesive goes through there and really glues the wires in place as well as the covering. If you need anything like this, Amazon has a lot of it, but there's also specialty electrical shops. Look around and make sure you buy the best quality you can. Quality matters a lot when it comes to these components because I have a whole drawer full of things that I've tried in the past that were all terrible. If you have any questions about this, go ahead and leave them in the comments down below. As always, I'll see you in the next video.